Selon cette Muslim, interprétation, par exemple. But that would mean that the words are superfluous because the statute already says without that, killing members of the group with the intent to destroy the group. Le texte so what does it mean, destroy the group as such? En tout, en partie, un Again, it comme means Alors, ça while the quoi, individuals, répète, some of them, may live on. The group is destroyed as a group. Individus peuvent rester en vie, mais le groupe en tant que groupe racial, est détruit, groupe d'un point de vue national, ethnique, racial ou religieux. Si on considère un groupe religieux, on dit si vous ne vous reconvertissez pas, vous allez mourir. You destroy the group as Alors, such, because those who were not killed are those who gave up their religion. By killing members of the group, those who insist on maintaining their identity as a member of that group, you've destroyed the group. And we believe that's happening in, in other places in the world right now at the moment also. So this is very critical because the Cham people, it is also the case that the policy to the Cham evolved over time. And we had evidence in our case that the attempt to forcibly assimilate the Cham, mm -hmm. to prevent them from practicing their religion, prevent them from wearing the traditional dress, prevent them from speaking their own language, occurred early in the regime, even before 1975, even as early as 1973, these, this type of persecution started to try to forcibly assimilate the Cham. And then the policy changed, particularly after the uh, rebellions, when small villages in Sve Klang, Kopal, refused to give up their religion and picked up knives and swords to try to fight Khmer Rouge with, armed with guns and heavy weapons. And then they were seen more suspiciously by the regime. Ah, this group is not so willing to go along with us. The next policy, and in addition to killing, the killings began, but also they began to try to disperse the Cham, to send them especially out of the areas where the Cham were traditionally concentrated, that is along the Mekong, around Kampong Cham province, particularly the three districts of uh, Kampong Siem, uh, Kroch Chimar, and uh, and uh, Kang Mias, those three districts. <laughs> so, one of the first ways that the authorities attempted to destroy the group was by forbidding the practice of the religion. Now, the defense uh, in the brief filed by Munchea, they point to various decisions where certain restrictions on religious practice have been uh, found to be not violating international law, things like you cannot pray in the street. However, for example, one of the cases I believe they cite, SAS versus France, provides clearly in paragraph 125 that international law recognizes it's a human right to practice to manifest one, one's religion. What that case says in paragraph 125, I quote, while religious freedom is primarily a matter of individual conscience, it also implies freedom to manifest one's religion, alone and in private, or in community with others, in public and within the circle of those whose faith one shares. Well, that's exactly what was forbidden by the Khmer Rouge for the Muslims, also for Buddhists, who forbade the, pra the practice of religion. They stopped teaching the teaching of religion to children, that was forbidden. The customs and the language of the Cham, they attempted to outlaw. And they tried to disperse the Cham from these areas they were concentrated to other areas around Cambodia. Even Ban Siak, 
Ho, the district mm. secretary in Crotch Chamar, late in the regime. Recall he testified here the 5th of October, um, I believe it was 2015. He didn't admit many things, particularly about his own role in the killing of Cham. But one of the things he did admit is that the Cham were prohibited from practicing their religion. Another witness, Or Ho, had been a village chief in Kampong Tom during the DK regime. And he said that a higher representative of Ankar told him, quote, in Kampuchea, there would only be one single population, that is Khmer. There wouldn't be no Cham. He testified to that on the 20th of May, 2015. He also testified that the Cham were not allowed to stay in their village and they were relocated or dispersed here and there. He said, as for their religion, or we can say also for Buddhism, the religion was abolished. They were not allowed to worship anymore. Him Man uh, testified in this court, he was a Cham from Kangmias district. He told the court that after, Your Honors, that after the 17th of April Khmer Rouge victory, during the dry season, most of the Cham were forcibly sent to other places. He said, including the, the Hakim in his village, the religious leader. And his family was one of only about 30 families that were allowed to remain, while previously there had been two to 300 families. A man testified that, quote, the Khmer Rouge would broadcast announcements. As of now, there are no longer any Cham and no longer any Khmer. We are all part of the same nation, the Khmer nation. He said that during that dry season in 1975, the Cham that remained were called to a meeting and the village chief told them, quote, everything in relation to Islamic religion, we were prohibited from practicing the religion. And at the time, we were told that the wheel of history was moving on. And if we happened to put our hands in or put our legs in to stop the wheel, our limbs would be cut. A man testified to that on the 17th of April, 2015. Another witness was Itzan. Uh, Itzan told OCIJ that in Ampil village in Kampong Cham, under the DK regime, quote, we were not allowed to obey Cham religion and to speak Cham language. Women were required to have very short haircuts. We were forced to have collective meals and to eat pork. No explanation was made by the Khmer Rouge, and those who refused such practices would be killed. Now, there was an incident. There aren't that many Cham in the northwest zone. But there was an incident that's reported in one of the um, weekly reports from Sector 5. This is document E3-178, where the local authorities report to the center, Ankar, that Cham in the Northwest Zone, who had attempted to rely on the Constitution's promise of freedom of religion, they were protesting uh, the food that was being served. They said it was against the religion. And the Sector 5 Committee reports, for this situation, we have taken special measures. That is, look for their string, look for the head of their movement in order to sweep clean. Another way you destroy a group is by targeting specific parts of the group that are very important for the group's survival. In the Kerstich appeal judgment, they talked about that. In paragraph 12, the appeals chamber said, in addition to the numeric size of the targeted portion, its prominence within the group can be a useful consideration. If a specific part of the group is emblematic of the overall group, 
or is essential to its survival, that may support a finding that the part qualifies as substantial within the meaning of the Genocide Convention. Recall, the requirement is that you attempt to destroy in whole or in part. Cases say the in part has to be a substantial part, substantial in the sense that it affects, could affect this, the, uh, the remainder of the group. This happened in, in the Democratic Kampuchea to the Cham, where the number of Hakim, the Cham village leaders, declined from about 113 to 20. This is from Isa Osman's reports and books. And the number of Tun, the teachers of Islam, from 300 to 38. Isa Osman testified on the 10th of February last year that in the early DK years, 75 and 76, killing was not directed at all Cham, but only at those who refused to obey instructions to give up religion, customs and language. But that itself can be sufficient to constitute genocide if you target these people who refuse to give up the religion, customs, and language. If you kill all of them, you will have destroyed the group. But in any event, you saw us went on to say that the policy changed toward the end of the regime as the regime's leaders became more paranoid and more deadly. So I'd like to show slide number eight. Um, I talked about the Cham Heartland. Uh, we had a lot of testimony about these three districts, Kampong Siem, Kroch Chumar, and Kang Mias, because they are essential parts of the Cham community in Cambodia, and we submit it's necessary for the survival of the group. They constitute a substantial part whose survival would certainly affect the survival of the whole group in Cambodia. Now, early parts of the regime, as I said, the policy was to break up the Cham, particularly in this area, along the river. And we see that in the next slide, in Telegram 15, sent by Sao Pim, to the center. It's from November 1975. <coughs> and he talks about uh, the deportation of the Cham. He says, we have deported only the Cham from along the river and the border. The transfer is in principle designed to disperse the Cham as per our previous discussion. Sao Pim, of course, being one of the members of the Standing Committee, although he often was away and not attending meetings, a member of the highest policy-making body of the Khmer Rouge, of the DK regime. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the testimony of one very important witness, and that was the former district secretary in Kampong Siem, one of those three districts we just saw. In the Nunchia final brief, recognizing how damaging her testimony is, how powerful her testimony is, in that it establishes a policy of genocide against the Cham. Nunchia puts forth what we submit as a very silly conspiracy theory about why, how the prosecution could have been so prescient to put down Prak Yut to testify in the Cham section of this trial. Your Honors, anyone who knows the case file would want to hear from the district secretaries in Kampong Siem, Kang Mias, and Krach Jamar. We also put down of Van Seik Ho, and he came and testified, the district secretary from Krach Jamar, even though he continued to lie about his own involvement in that killing, his testimony was very important. He was the district secretary in Krach Jamar when much of this killing took place. The same with Prak Yut, who was one of the Southwest Zone cadres sent up 
to the center, what had been the center zone, and carrying out this genocidal policy. <coughs> As I said, anyone who knows the case file would want to hear from the district secretary. Anyone who knows the case file and wants to get to the truth would want to hear from the district secretary of Kampong Siam. Uh, there's plenty in the case file about what went on in that district. For example, Alexander Hinton, in his book, The Expert Witness Who Testified, in his book, Why Did They Kill, he wrote, the death toll was particularly brutal in Kampong Siam district. Two PRK documents alleged that almost every cham in the district was executed. Estimates range from 2,000 families to 20,000 people. Also, Your Honors, Esau Osman, in his book, uh, at the end of his book, I believe it's uh, the Cham Rebellion book, he lists 10 villages that once were Cham, but where there are virtually no Cham left. 10 Cham villages completely wiped out during the DK regime. Five of those villages are from Kampong Siam district. Also, by uh, the time we submitted that witness list in 2014, the Commune Secretary Yu Van had already implicated the District Secretary Prak Yu in those uh, killings of the Cham. So it didn't take anything, any uh, ability to foresee the future, to see how critical the district secretary's testimony would be. And it was critical. And it was extremely damaging to the defense because she showed there was a policy to kill the Chandler district. We can show the next video. There was an order from the sector level to us to purge the jam, and I myself was also wondering why the jam were wanted to be purged, and I was not sure how many jam people living in my district. So I uh, told them that I did not grasp the exact number of jam people living in Kampongsiem district. So I uh, asked the upper level to take note of this point. De note de ce point. And regarding the Cham people, I myself was also wondering why the name of the Cham people were wanted to be purged. But the order came from the upper echelon, so I simply supérieur. implemented it. Prakut was very defensive about her own role during Prakut her testimony, but it's clear she had an order to purge all the champ. In her earlier statements to OCI, OCIJ, she said the same. She said, <laughs> during the purge, I only knew that, sorry, this is from her testimony of 18 January 2016. During the purge, I only knew that Cham people had been taken away and killed. I was told by the secretary, sector secretary, her boss, based on the instructions from the upper echelon. Prakut also told the OCI and J investigators, I would like to clarify once again that the orders I received were very clear. They stated that we must kill all the jam. I had no choice other than to carry out orders. And we know from the testimony of uh, Yu Van, a commune secretary, that she was ordered by Prakut to prepare lists of cham Vietnamese and former Sihanouk soldiers. And she testified in this court on 14 January 2016 that she noticed the gradual disappearance of the Cham. She talked to the district military commander and he told her all those Cham had been purged. 
fait l'objet de pure recherche. Another interesting aspect of Yvan's testimony. She was close to Prakut, she worked under her. And she said Prakut went to Phnom Penh once or twice, twice a month. Sometimes for up to a 10-day study session. So it's clear that the policies that Prakut were implementing were the policies from the center, from the Phnom Penh, from the accused in Pol Pot. Prakut wasn't the only witness who testified about killing of Cham, and it wasn't only in Kampong Siam. Seng Khoi was a Khmer villager. He was ordered to help transport Cham women and children to their deaths at the Wat Al Chakon security center. He said he heard the chief of the commune security carrying out the arrest say, quote, we will kill all the Cham people and we will not spare anyone. Muk Sengle is a civil party, a Khmer villager from Kampong Siam district. He told OCIJ that at a meeting he heard Prakut say, Cham are the enemy of Ankar because they plan to rebel. So Ankar has to smash them. If any Cham remain, this must be reported so they can be swept clean because this is the plan of the upper echelon. Um, Your Honor, I'll try to uh, break soon. Let me just point out quickly that there are others. We have other evidence of people who heard of a plan to eliminate the champ. Say Duan, the head of a unit in Kanmias district, which was who, who was charged with arresting champ, testified. Quote, I heard of the plan that no cham, no single cham shall be spared. He testified to that on the 12th of January last year. Sos Ramli testified on the 8th of January. He was a clerk to the commune chief in Crotch Jamar district. And he said that a security chief came in who didn't know that he was cham, because Sos Ramli then certainly didn't wear dress in traditional cham clothing. And he heard the securities. Uh, sector chief, when he heard that 15% of the original Cham in that commune still remained, told him in the future those Cham people would be smashed until no one was less left. Sos Kamri uh, was working in a mobile unit in Kampong Cham. He testified that in, he attended a meeting in Chamkar Lu district in 1977 where there was a plan about smashing the cham discussed, and he later saw a booklet in the Ao Nong commune office that described cham as the biggest enemy who must be totally smashed before 1980. And finally, Ben Kiernan interviewed Ya Mat, who told him about seeing a document in 1978 in Sector 43 of the Central Zone, titled Document 163, which said, we will not spare the Cham because if spared, they will resist. They must all be killed off. And Kiernan talked to another individual, Ossel, who told him he also had seen Document 163, but in June 1978 in the Barre district. Perhaps this is a good time for a break, Your Honor, if you'd like. Is this time for the break? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm confused about the break time. Thank you. So going back to Kampong Siam, where Prakut was the district secretary. Uh, OCIJ sent an investigator out to the Trian commune. Trian is, I believe, one of 11 communes in Kampong Siam district. <coughs> and the investigator went around to 12 villages in that commune and talked to people who had been alive during the DK regime and asked them, do they remember anything about Cham people being in their village? These people estimated adding up the difference in you know, each of the statements from each of the 12 villages, there were 292 Cham families in those 12 villages that were taken away and disappeared during the, re the regime. 
Many of their corpses, they said, were dumped in water wells or in bomb craters. These elderly villagers who, who remember the DK regime said that they knew of only three survivors from that commune out of, with 292, as I said, approximately, Cham families that disappeared. If we use what I think is a very conservative estimate of five people per family, 292 families, my math is right, that is 1,465 individuals killed in those 12 villages alone. And that's just one of 11 communes in Prakit's district. Prakit herself testified that she reported to the center there were 1,600 Cham villages, excuse me, Cham families in Kampong Siam when she arrived. So that would be over 8,000 individuals. And then she said she saved one Cham. There was one young girl that she had adopted when she was in the southwest zone, apparently, not knowing that she was Cham, Peep. And she talked about Peep in this during her testimony. I'd like to play the video to remind you of Prakut's testimony about her adopted daughter, Peep. And uh, in fact, I was not aware en that fait, she was jammed when her parents took her to me to rest her. And then I actually consulted uh, Pip, and Pip is currently my Pip. younger in law who is Pip still Pip alive in Stangai. And I kept her alive ma belle -fille. because Elle personally, my view was that. I hate to think of the life of the other people, je que je devais penser à la vie and that's why personnes. I decided to keep uh, Pip alive until pour cela today. Que décidé de la en vie and Pip is actually a jam person from Stengkail, which was the area where the jam people lived. Qui est des où les jam. And What I said here may be considered that I was individualistic, that I only thought of one person and not to think about the other Jams people within the district. And allow me to say that because I rest her and I decided to keep her, and she is now my uh, in law and still alive today at Stunkang. And that is the truth. Because, uh, in my opinion, I thought of her, and I pitied her. So this is, in our view, very significant testimony. Prakut saying she saved Prakut the life of Peep. Because of her, Peep is alive. Grâce à elle, Peep est Why? Vivante. What would Peep, Pourquoi? what reason would there have been to kill Peep? There's only one reason, because she was Jam. And that was enough for killing all the other Jam people in Kampong Siam district. She saved Peep because Peep had the fortune of having a connection to the district secretary. She survived. But the other Jam were targeted to be killed. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the testimony we have heard about the neighboring district of Kang Mias. This is also part of the same sector, Sector 41, which again, late in the regime, was under the uh, authority of a former Southwest cadre Om An, that's the sector secretary. Him Man testified before your honors <coughs> that he talked about after the arrival, particularly after the arrival of the Southwest cadres, a long sword group would receive orders to arrest Cham from the district secretary. 
Cham would be arrested and then sent to the Wat Ochakun Pagoda. A man testified 17 September 2015. He said that in addition to Cham, there also were new people and also former soldiers of the former regime, of the Lan Nol regime, in that prison. But we have evidence from witnesses of two differences in how the Cham were treated at that horrible place, Wat Atchukon, and these others were treated. In the WRI witness statement to OCIJ of Sok Ming Li, that's E3 slash 9654 at answer 13. He says that one of the differences with the Cham is that whole families were arrested together. And also, witness Mouvani noted in his testimony that unlike these former Law Nol soldiers or new people, Cham were not interrogated. There was no